We've had an extraordinary two-day conference here that has been going on intensively, and our guest of honor and speaker tonight, who I'll introduce in a moment, has been uh, nonstop performing uh, brilliantly here on this podium, along with many others, some of whom are still here in the audience. But welcome to those of you who, who are joining us for the first time. You, you are going to be very uh, fascinated, I think, by what follows. Um, uh, I am uh, John Shattuck, for those of you who don't know me. I'm the rector and president of Central European University. Um, and it's an enormous privilege to welcome, I've been working on him for years, welcome Paul Farmer to CEU, uh, where we started talking about this several years ago. And I think, uh, I hope we haven't disappointed him in our ability to host uh, a conference and his uh, perspective on things that are that you will hear in just a moment. Um, Paul and I are uh, colleagues and, and old friends from our days at uh, uh, Harvard together, my days in Boston, and from the extraordinary work that Paul has done in Haiti, which is where our paths first crossed in the 1990s. And I thought in, in introducing Paul, if, if you'll allow me, I'd just like to say a very few words about Haiti. Uh, in a kind of historical context, only a very few. I'm not going to steal any, anything that's going to follow. But I think it's important to put this in the context of what Paul, what Paul has done uh, in contributing uh, so extraordinarily to uh, the struggles around the world for uh, all kinds of development efforts, but particularly in the, in the public health field. Um, I think the Haiti really illustrates the myths and facts about foreign aid in so many powerful ways. The enemies of development, I'm sure everyone would agree, are poverty and disease. And these have been Haiti's mortal enemies for centuries. Haiti is the second oldest independent country in the Western Hemisphere, and you can guess what the other one is. It was born in 1804 in the shadow of the French Revolution and grew out of a slave rebellion against the French colonial elite. The country's founding father, a heroic figure, Toussaint Louverture, was the leader of a slave rebellion um, who saw himself as Haiti's Napoleon. After all, this was the Napoleonic era. Within three years, the Haitian Revolution was brutally suppressed by Napoleon's troops, or some of them. And for the next 200 years, the country was ruled by tyranny and dominated by poverty and disease. My own experience in Haiti, and it was brief but very intense, was as a human rights official during the Clinton administration. In 1994, I was involved in implementing an effort to restore Haiti's first democratically elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide. I spent many days with many heroic Haitians and came to identify with their struggle uh, to change their country and their lives. And it was through my work in Haiti that I came to know Paul Farmer, which is really why we're all here tonight and what's much more important than my own experience. Paul began his commitment to the people of Haiti more than 25 years ago, working with villages in Haiti's central plateau and then while he was a medical student, founding a rural health complex, including a hospital and a series of clinics and schools that pioneered the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis and HIV AIDS for hundreds of thousands of Haitians. And starting with his work in Haiti, Paul, over the years, has become, I would say, the world's foremost strategist for combating disease in conditions of extreme poverty. He's worked with the World Health Organization, with Partners in Health, the extraordinary organization, the NGO that he himself co-founded, and with the Open Society Foundations and many, many others. And he's developed treatment programs across the globe, in Haiti, in Rwanda, where he has made similarly intense commitments of time and energy and creativity in Peru, in Russia, in Azerbaijan, in Latvia, in Kazakhstan, and many other places. In fact, I often wonder if there, isn't a, if there is any place in the globe that has not in some way been touched by Paul's strategic thinking. 
his extraordinary work on behalf of the world's poorest populations has been recognized, as we know, with many awards and honors, and he's the subject of the best-selling book by a Pulitzer Prize-winning author, Mountains Beyond Mountains, The Quest of Paul Farmer, A Man Who Would Cure the World. I love that title, and I think it's quite appropriate. Um, there are many details that I could fill in about Paul's life and career, his work as a Harvard professor, his uh, work with President Clinton, uh, most recently as a UN official uh, involved in this area, but I didn't want to give you uh, simply a recitation of his biography, but rather a sense from one of his friends and colleagues of what he has done uh, over these years uh, in this extraordinary time. Paul has a unique and revolutionary approach toward development assistance. I think the world should pay attention to it, to what he says about it, and above all, what he is doing about it. So Paul, welcome to see you. Thank you. And I'll stay put. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite, but sometimes I'm technically challenged. Thank you, John, for that um, generous uh, introduction. And I, um, I'm not, you'll be happy to know, especially those who were good enough to attend this two-day conference, that I will not be repeating my re talk, um, which was really that. It was a, a, a reflection on some of the dominant myths um, that, that we see in the circles in which some of us move if we're involved in, in development uh, assistance. Again, I use the word uh, foreign aid with quotation marks around it. Instead, what I'd like to do is comment, show you those, what those myths are and uh, go through some of the experience, experiences that I've had and we've had, um, finding out that these are myths. And, and uh, there are many others, of course. I've just chosen uh, some that I think are important to, to reflect on. And I will, uh, glad you mentioned, John, that I do have a paying job, which is uh, you know, working for a small community-based college in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and, and that has given me, over the years, uh, a, a lot of latitude. And I'm very grateful for to have a post at a university. And I'm sorry it has taken me so long to come to this one, as promised many years ago when you first came here. But here I am. and I. I'd like, I'm, I'm going to Rwanda tomorrow, but I'm thinking about just moving in in Budapest this time. Um, and of course, I, I'm not going to start talking about Haiti or any of our other work without recognizing uh, Michel Pierre Louis, the former prime minister of Haiti, a great friend of mine uh, for many years before that, who, as I'll mention in the course of these remarks, helped to support our initial work in the 90s uh, on taking on one of the biggest problems. Uh, that we faced, which was chronic infectious disease. Uh, and Daniel Henris, who was uh, Minister of Health and also a good friend who I met in central Haiti probably more than 25 years ago. Um, and uh, so I'm very grateful to have my Haitian uh, friends and, and colleagues here. Now, um, I'll, I'll just, instead of, this is what I'm not going to do, is read, go through the myths. Oh, that, and, my, and my colleagues who were there will forgive me. I tried hard to write that out carefully, the talk that I gave. Um, instead, I'd like to show, the, uh, by reflecting as a physician might, um, uh, someone who was lucky enough to go to Haiti now, over 30 years ago to central Haiti, and to be engaged in that, uh, in that work there and elsewhere, uh, through an NGO, uh, as John mentioned, called Partners in Health, uh, which had a sister organization founded even before it called Zami La Santé, which means Partners in Health in Creole, in Haitian Creole. So you, can, you get the idea of, of the, the depths of my own personal debt to Haiti. And I'm very grateful, John, that you started with Haitian history uh, because that's what often gets left out, especially in contemplating myths about development assistance or foreign aid. History gets erased. And local experience also gets erased as we seek generalizable uh, notions about how to promote what we all want, which is uh, economic development uh, with justice, or at least what I think enough of us in this room want. Uh, so the question of why there are persistent myths and persistent poverty uh, are important questions, and I think they're well addressed uh, in a university. And I've tried to target this 
um, these remarks more to people studying policy than I would say if I was at a hospital or a medical school. And uh, so I'm going to keep going back to the policy question since I'm led to believe that many of the stu graduate students here uh, work on policy. Now, remember, just take a little picture in your mind, memorize all five of those myths as we do in medical school. Just learn to memorize it and we'll move on. Now, uh, I wanted to point out that there are a lot of complementary frameworks that we're familiar with, and, uh, and I will draw on those. It took me, um, and maybe, I'm, it took me many years to just be able to say what I'm about to say about these complementary paradigms. I'm not proud that it took me a decade to figure out how these were related. For example, a, a rights-based paradigm, which a lot of us in this room, certainly many people working with OSI and OSF, are very comfortable with right space paradigms. That, that's one that we draw on very frequently. Um, some focus on certain kinds of rights, because there are many different rights paradigms. Um, and if you're interested in that particular area, I'd be, you know, we'd be glad to discuss this in, in q and I'm very interested in, in competing rights paradigms and complementary between rights paradigms. Here I'm just going to talk about the idea of health as a human right, uh, which you'd be surprised in some places, even countries that I've been born in, is quite a, that was supposed to be a joke, you can only be born in, <laughs> you can only be born in one country, is, is, is quite a contentious uh, issue, the right to health care. Now I'm going to treat it if it's not, unless someone would like to challenge me. Uh, in public health, though, rights paradigms are quite rare. And uh, we talk about not so much the rights paradigm, or it is often not talked about in that way, but is public goods for public health. I'll give you an example of each of these. And then a much more dominant paradigm, as I was just saying on the way in, talking to some, someone about e economics, uh, is the economic development paradigm. So again, there are many. The one that I'll refer to is breaking a cycle of poverty and disease through investments in public health, education, and basic infrastructure. So just to give an illustration of each of these. Um, these words uh, by Martin Luther King have a lot of resonance, I think, for people even outside of human rights who are not that interested in, in particularly interested in human rights. I think because all of, all of us can imagine what it might be like to be sick and at least alone. Maybe it's hard for people to imagine what it'd be like to be sick and poor. Now, if you do this work, it's not difficult at all because the first thing you see in looking at health disparities is poverty. And there are many other kinds of ways of marginalizing people, uh, but if you look at the poorest health outcomes in the world, they occur among people living in uh, a dire poverty. So the link between human rights and health and human rights is pretty straightforward to those who are uh, uh, working in settings like this, as, as ML, M, MLK say said a long time ago. Public goods for public health. What does that mean? Um, well, this is actually a, a ward in, I'm going back to Rwanda tomorrow, as I said, this is a ward in southeastern Rwanda, actually after it was, uh, uh, it was an abandoned hospital, abandoned after the war and genocide there. And you can see in, in this ward uh, mosquito nets, right? And anybody who works in public health would be able to quickly name a number of interventions that are considered to confer advantage on you know, those right under the uh, mosquito nets, but uh, for others as well. Uh, the, the classic example in, in my line of work, I didn't mention that I'm an infectious disease physician, is, uh, is tuberculosis. And that's because it's airborne. So if it's conveyed in the air, then the idea that you could defer diagnosis and care of tuberculosis uh, based on someone's ability to pay for those services has never, uh, it's never worked, of course, but lots of things don't work. It's also been taken up as an important public health intervention that should not be uh, dictated by uh, the financial capacity of the, the afflicted. You get diagnosed with TB across the world, uh, even in places with strongly market-driven medical systems, and you're supposed to be diagnosed and cared for by a public health system. Now, of course, it doesn't always work that way, as, as everyone in my line of work knows. That's why uh, there are epidemics of tuberculosis all over the world. Indeed, it was until probably 1999 the leading infectious killer of 
young adults in the world. And, uh, and that is, of course, 50 years after the development of effective anti-tuberculous medications. And I think you can guess which infectious pathogen surpassed uh, tuberculosis in 1999. I'll be talking a lot about, about HIV as well, in part because the claim that responding to HIV was a public health imperative was slow to take on uh, in those initial years in the eyes of, of, of some, but actually when it did, when a, uh, HIV diagnosis and care, AIDS treatment and uh, diagnosis and care was taken up as a publicly funded or supported uh, endeavor, it really changed uh, what a lot of us are calling global health and brought that emerging arena of inquiry into existence. I'm, I'm not saying that global health is a discipline like economics or molecular biology. I'm saying this is a collection of problems, uh, but it has brought a lot of young people into public health, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then finally, this uh, in, in very difficult, and there, I, I'm just wondering who here is an economist or studies economics here. So this is in some ways the more, among the more contested arenas is economics. I, this is a picture of Kigali, as my colleague Jahan. I actually have lived there, and I looked at it and said, where is this, Nairobi? Oh. Yeah. And in re one of the reasons I, was, I, couldn't, uh, I didn't really recognize is because Kigali has changed, the capital of Rwanda has changed so dramatically just in the last decade that I've been living and working there. It is, Rwanda has, I will argue here, broken that cycle of poverty and disease uh, through investments in public health, public education, and of course other forms of human security. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about it. So those are the three complementary paradigms I'll ask you to have in mind as I proceed with my example and then we'll return to the myths. Now first, uh, I promise to, um, where do I, did I point this at John Shattuck for it to advance? Is that how it works? It did work. Um, <laughs> I, I promise to, to tell a little bit about uh, my own engagement in this work, particularly uh, in Haiti. Um, and I went there not in 1984, but 1983, uh, 30 years ago. Um, I was uh, just graduated from college and on my way to medical school. And um, it was in the first, I'll just uh, say this in, uh, in, in shorthand, in the first years, I don't know if it's different, uh, but young Americans, uh, increasingly have experiences like this. I'm sure there are people uh, across Europe or affluent parts of Asia who end up going to a place that is very different from where they grew up. And uh, for the first few years after I went there, uh, the stories that we tell about what it is we're doing tend to be what an anthropologist might call vict a victory narrative. Um, right? You, you, isn't it great that we went there and what a great year that was? Thank you very much, Reinhardt. That also gives me a chance to say publicly, thank you, uh, thank you, Wolfgang, not just for the water, but for your welcome here. <laughs> I should have written that down. Now I know to point the pointer at, at, at him. But that's not what it was like at all. It was actually a very difficult year. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not confident that, that I did anyone any good uh, during that year. And I worked in a clinic as a volunteer not pretending I was a physician, but just writing down patients' names and working with a Haitian physician and checking vital signs, like someone's blood pressure. And this between that year between uh, medical school, uh, college uh, and medical school. And I can tell you that the experience was quite brutalizing for the physician, although again, it took me years to even admit this. And he took him, he took him less time to say, this is uh, overwhelming, there'd be people lined up hundreds of people sometimes to see a physician, but he didn't have a laboratory, a proper pharmacy. Uh, uh, he certainly didn't have a proper assistant. And uh, it was, uh, he, you know, this is what we call in, in American slang in a way, burnout. And uh, I didn't burn out because I went back to Harvard to continue my medical studies, uh, which occurred in, uh, in, in beautiful hospitals. Some of you know them. You saw them on television after the Boston Marathon bombings, uh, places where there's adequate safety nets and there are problems with American health care, particularly the management of chronic disease. But for tertiary care, and I'm going to talk about tertiary care, which is 
uh, for those of you who are not in medicine. That's for problem, people with problems like the ones I saw actually in my first year in Haiti. I saw someone die shortly after childbirth of a disease that I believe is named for someone from this part of the world, Semmelweis's peripheral sepsis, which has been wiped out across Europe. I, do I get brownie points for knowing that that's a Budapest? Um, and uh, uh, cerebral malaria, again, is someone who, who uh, friend, these are people I knew, by the way. These are my coworkers, not the patients in the clinic. These are my coworkers. Three young people. Um, again, this is not the story that, that we tell in those first years. And then a third one, who, a colleague who died of uh, a perforated ileum, uh, you know, his guts ruptured uh, because he had typhoid. Now, there are ways of preventing typhoid, peripheral sepsis, and cerebral malaria. I just showed you public goods for public health, mosquito nets, proper hand washing, as Semmelweis said here, and clean water. But for someone who's already sick as, or injured, as was the case in the Boston Marathon bombings, you need a system with hospitals. So what I'm trying to remind you and remind myself is that this fight between prevention and care that we would later see when HIV came along has always been one of the great mortal dramas of medicine and public health. And it's a big mistake when we say, well, we should only do one or the other. Although I've actually not, I've not seen so much the latter, where we only do uh, tertiary care and ignore all other problems in the work that I've done in Haiti, Rwanda, Malawi, and Lesotho. Now let me try to make this vivid and link that uh, at the end to uh, the five myths. I went to this town called Mirabale, which is, um, I'll close with a picture from there. You, you, my Haitian friends know what's coming. And, uh, it was that experience in the clinic was so difficult for me that first year that I was very relieved to go someplace where there was no clinic at all. And that was a squatter settlement called Conge, which was about, at the time, an hour away from Mirabale. Again, this is not the story as I told it to my friends and family in 1983 and 1984. This is a story it took me 10 years to, to tell and figure out, just as it took me a long time to think about these complementary paradigms. And uh, so there was no clinic here. And again, I, that, that struck everyone in that town, that village as a significant problem. There was no school, no clinic, no clean water, no electricity. Now, the, the question that we're asking uh, and have been asking here in the la over the last two days, these problems of underdevelopment, are they, are they insuperable problems? Of course they're not. Um, they're in fact quite superable. Each one of them uh, can be addressed. For example, you don't have any trees in the squ squatter settlement. You don't have a, a, a clinic or a hospital. But you know, just a few years later, you could go back to the same village or, uh, and say, well, it's, now it's got trees. And it also has employment, which is why people aren't cutting down the trees. It's because they have jobs. And it has hospitals, schools, et cetera. And again, I w I'm not showing you this because I, it's in any way extraordinary. Um, if you plant trees in a place where they're not cut down, they actually will grow. Uh, and if you build a better facility, a better hospital or clinic, people will show up for it. And if you actually have people to work with your physicians and nurses, and a, um, like community health workers, I'll talk a little bit about them, then this system can work. So that's not the story I'm, I'm going to uh, focus on. I want to... Uh, ask you to think what it might be like, and uh, I'm especially pleased that there are so many colleagues here from Burma, by the way, who is my first chance to meet them. Who, and many, many of the people who are visiting from Burma have already thought about these questions. But say you're in rural Haiti and you open up a facility like this. What happens? Now, if you only focus on a public health paradigm, you, 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 you could be pretty disappointed when someone shows up, say, with cancer or AIDS uh, or other illnesses for which you do not have a strategy. Uh, and trust me, every time you open up a facility like this, certainly in a city, but even in rural areas, that's exactly what happens. You believe that you have a strategy uh, for good primary care, public health, and someone comes in with a fractured femur because they got hit by a car, or someone comes in with a brain tumor, or someone comes in uh, with AIDS. 
And I have no experience in now these 25, uh, 30 years of working in this field of not seeing this in every place I've worked, including Boston, of course, as I said, but also in all the other places. So the idea that in the first world, places like Budapest, you have chronic disease and people have cancer. In the third world, people have malaria, uh, typhoid, the three diseases I mentioned, and die in childbirth. That idea is false. They also have, in those settings, in addition to that burden of vaccine-preventable illness or an infectious disease, they also have cancer, chronic disease, and they have road trauma. So this is what some epidemiolo epidemiologists call, call the double burden that is borne by the poor. And it's borne by the poor in rich countries, and it's borne by the poor in poor countries, and it is the central problem of what a lot of us are calling global health equity. Now, how is that related to myths about development? Well, first of all, Complexity of a problem. This is a, uh, this, you know, this is a, of course, I've asked for uh, uh, the permission of this patient to use his picture. Um, this is a patient I got to know very well. This is from some years ago. Um, is, is a young man named Joseph came back from uh, Port-au-Prince um, to, uh, to die. And he came, came, his mother and family brought him to a, a little bit more on where they brought him, not to the squatter settlement, but to a public facility not too far away where we'd started working. And I just invite you to, again, Im to imagine yourself as either the patient or the family member or the, the, the clinician. And what, what, is, what is the strategy? He also had tuberculosis. Again, anybody who's been a physician and worked in pl uh, the place I have has seen many patients like Joseph, although particularly funny and colorful person, it turns out, although we didn't know that when we met him because he was obtunded. In fact, when I, I was asked to see him, I was up in the squatter settlement, which was no longer, people living there don't even remember that it was a squatter settlement, by the way, which is a very gratifying thing. When I first went there, uh, people would, sometimes people would say, um, you know, is, do you have something I can eat? And now they're likely to say, can you, I need a ma Apple, ma a Macintosh, or I need an Apple computer, which I think is good progress. This guy, however, was obtunded in medical terms. And, uh, and I was asked to come there by uh, a, this, actually the person who took this picture was a Harvard medical student at the time, now a colleague of mine on the faculty of Harvard, and by the Haitian uh, physicians and nurses I, I, I worked with. And I said, well, why do you need me to come? I've, you've seen patients like this a, a million times. Now, of course, I wanted them to say to me, Paul, we want you to come because you're the world's greatest infectious disease doctor. But they didn't say that. <laughs> They said, uh, we want you to come and, and cheer him up. Now I said, what am I, clowns without borders? <laughs> Unfortunately, I said that in New York and someone came up to me and said, I'm from Clowns Without Borders and I wish you'd, so I, have to, I figured it's safe and, but oh wait, you're streaming this live. In any case, what would you do uh, if you're a clinician? Now here's, this is for the policy, and I'm just wondering, who's working on any kind of policy issue at CEU? Not, so fewer than I, than I had thought. But this was the time when this young man was sick, which isn't that long ago. Uh, we were talking about this over the last two days, how global health has been transformed by thinking around equity and this illness. So you can, you've seen these. I took the names actually off of the, what did I do? Jahan? Is that like a, is that, is that USAID administrators? Is that what did it, Pam? <laughs> All right, no, I, I think I'll catch up. Come, come right back. Um, so I took the names of the people who said these things off because it's not my intention to disparage anyone. Um, but this was conventional thinking in policy circles, even by those charged with the response to AIDS. And I think it's you know, important. To th uh, I've been asked sometimes by people who've made these statements, why do you keep repeating this? And that's why I took their names. I'm not repeating it because they said it. I'm repeating it because it said, gets said every time about a complex illness that affects primarily poor people. And basically, to summarize this, it's, the arguments were it is not cost effective to treat this disease. It's not sustainable. It's not a wise use of resources. Quite a long list. And again, I've just chosen this one because I had the materials handy. Um, but it's the, the same story for even for obstructed labor. Um, or any malignancy that you can think of, or congestive heart failure. Again, think of 
ailments that your family or your parents, or your grandparents or someone you know might have acute leukemia, for example, in a child. This is standard uh, response. Now, happily, th this has changed a lot, but look how recent these comments are. I don't think 2001 is a long time ago, and this is exactly the time that this young man show showed up in, in clinic. Now, that's, this is a thing that really, you know, really is shocking to me, is that this is, this is what was happening at, during those very years. As I said, HIV replaced tuberculosis, the leading infectious killer of adults, but you could fill in, it some, it's going to be something else in the future, right? It's, there's going to be an equity gap that will grow as our technological capacity to diagnose and treat certain problems grows. And that's the thesis here. It's not about one disease. And I'll show you in a little bit that uh, you could apply the same logic to other problems. So this ART, for those of you um, who are not familiar with the terminology, that means antiretroviral therapy. I was actually an infectious disease fellow going between Harvard and Haiti during the year, and it was about in one year that it was shown and, uh, that ART, which is a three-drug or four-drug regimen, suppressive regimen for AIDS, that they were called back in the day AIDS cocktails, which I thought was a very colorful term, and I'm hoping I will be rewarded with one after this talk. <laughs> now, that's a, it was an interesting, I'm lucky, again, back to Haiti. This is uh, 12 years more after my first trip, and now I'm an infectious disease specialist at a big Harvard teaching hospital called the Brigham and Women's Hospital, terrific hospital. And what happens in that one year is that all the young people who are dying of AIDS in our hospitals in the United States, not all of them, but most of them, got up, went home, and uh, many, I know many of them to this day, is that they, they receive care for that disease just uh, as you would for another chronic ailment that for which there's a treatment. You know, again, fill in the blank. Um, it's not even that complicated a therapy to deliver. So the issue was not, as was said in those previous statements, that it was the complexity of the regimens. That was said a lot, but that wasn't true. The, the, in fact, um, you, you can decide yourself if a, uh, if a one pill a day, that was one of the regimens that we had, those are called fixed dose combinations. Um, the whole treatment can be put into one pill and you take it once or twice a day. We didn't have those then, but it didn't make a difference. We had community health workers, as I said, who had already worked with us to treat tuberculosis, another chronic infection. And I said yesterday, or the day before yesterday, in our first day here in Budapest, that everything I'm saying about HIV disease is also true soon of hepatitis C, which is another leading chronic infection for which we've, again, just developed more effective therapy with a cure rate, it looks, uh, much higher than the cure rate we get now, and this disease, AIDS, is incurable at all. So again, the general uh, idea here is that equity is important no matter what the illness we're considering might be. Now, uh, fortunately, this is not the way things proceeded after 2001-2002. And uh, I'd like to just say, it's interesting that you could make claims about the cost-effectiveness of certain regimens when the two words there, cost-effectiveness, involve how much something costs and how effective it is. Now, this is all, this is, a, uh, this is what was going on with certain drugs. Does, you know, don't need to remember what they are, but it just seems to me that if the prices are changing so rapidly, it would be hazardous to say that something was not cost-effective to treat in the face of such rapid change in cost. And it was actually much more dramatic than this later. So just to give you the numbers, it could cost up to $10,000, $15,000 per patient per year in the United States to treat some of the HIV disease. It's probably around $60 or $70 now for a generic uh, three-drug regimen that we obtain, say, in India and, uh, and use in our work across Africa and in Haiti. And of course, effectiveness is an important word. We talked a lot about it here in Budapest. We talked about aid effectiveness. And um, that's an important word in medicine, in case no one's told you that. Don't go to, if you have a broken leg, let me give you some advice. If you have a broken leg, you know, you can put a poultice on it, or, you know, as we might in California, or 
put some crystals together, it's not going to be very effective. <laughs> and, but there, uh, there are ways of measuring effectiveness and outcomes. And our argument in considering foreign aid was the same one. So cost, I'm saying as an, as an anthropologist, is socially constructed. Right? The cost of this problem was largely drugs, and the drug prices were plummeting. About 80% of our initial cost, I'm going to go back and make a little tribute to a friend of mine who's here. In 1998 was when we started saying, I saying, going between Harvard and Haiti, you know, it's not really sustainable, because we kept on hearing it's not sustainable, it's not cost effective. I said, you know, it's not sustainable personally for someone to go between Harvard and Haiti and be told on one end of that trajectory, that you can't treat the patients on the other end, that you better treat the patients. Or what we were saying to our patients was, please take these medicines, and on the other end is, it's not cost effective for us to treat you. That's what's not sustainable. Now, fortunately, it didn't need to be my argument or anyone else's argument. It literally wasn't sustainable. Um, with this kind of pattern, without a strategy, an equity strategy, we were in big trouble, as we are around a lot of problems to this very, I have mentioned cancer, hepatitis C. This is the same problem we face with all ailments for which we have some effective intervention. We need an equity strategy. Obviously, in the United States, we need an equity strategy in general as a nation so that we can address health disparities more effectively. Now, what happened here, and this is the same patient before and after, and some of you have seen this uh, or met this person. Thank, he's still around. So that's just after a few months of therapy. And we see this all the time in, in my work, so I, which is one of the reasons I like doing this work so much. And I won't go through every little detail, but I will in front of Michel Pierre-Louis and, and also uh, here at, uh, as a guest of OSF, say that we were going back and forth to funding agency after funding agency, company after company, foundation after foundation, saying, can somebody help us? get these drugs. And the refrain that we heard again and again was not effective, not cost effective, not sustainable, not a prudent use of your resources in a place like rural Haiti. Now the one exception, the first one, was Michel Pierre-Louis and George Soros, who as you see, that little arrow that says Focal OSI, were the first funders of this project to actually treat with antiretroviral therapy these patients in rural Haiti. So thank you. There she is. You can thank her. Now, what, what happened after that was it was great. And I don't, I don't want anybody to think that what occurred after isn't important. But there is a lot to be learned. And this is one of the things we spent the last two days talking about. The Global Fund uh, and PEPFAR, which is the US plan, first of all, to me, that was a big surprise that in 2002, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief would come from the Bush White House, but it did. Those two, those, that plan, PEPFAR, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria are the largest interventions in global health in human history, by far. And so now you see people saying, well, there's too much money going into AIDS. Don't believe it for a minute. Uh, the, the question is, how can we use those resources to strengthen health systems? Because this is just one problem among many, and there will be others. As uh, my colleagues have been talking with our uh, new colleagues from Burma about health systems a lot, but everywhere in the world that I've worked, this is the same challenge. Like I said, people will come in with you know, broken legs or uh, arrested labor, meaning uh, dying in childbirth. They'll come in with cancer. You need to build health systems. Now, the question from 10 years ago or 12 years ago when these first funding agencies came online, and we, of course, because of um, Focal and, and OSI, had already had a head start with these patients. We knew how to treat, it's not, again, not the most difficult illness to treat, if you ask me. Um, but we also knew that we had to build health systems. And as an NGO, and here's the big subject of what we've discussed here, is NGOs, which I represent and many people in this room do, civil society, as it said, are not going to be able to solve these big public health problems alone. And just looking around, and I'll show you a, a map of this place in a minute, as we grew this project and others, again, this was a uh, full-service hospital, not an AIDS treatment program. 
that existed well before AIDS did. As we grew the program, we saw a very disturbing trend all around us in rural Haiti, and that was the collapse of the public health system, in part because aid was so often politicized. And so aid would be like a carrot or a stick given or withdrawn with conditionalities, and the tax base of Haiti, and there's some people here um, who have been working as tax experts, believe it or not, in Rwanda and Burundi, and, and working to build up uh, the capacity in the public sector there. That's what we needed to be doing as an NGO, Partners in Health, was thinking about the public health system. You know, again, obvious to many people here, but you'd be surprised when you're in the field and working every day to try and build up your capacity to respond as an NGO, the first thing that you forget is the other parts of the formula, the public health system among them. But this is what we did with, the, with this money, by the way, uh, from the Global Fund and later PEPFAR is we said, well, yes, we're going to take care of patients with AIDS. And oh, by the way, they also have tuberculosis. Oh, and if you want us to prevent mother-to-child transmission, we're going to have to provide prenatal care. Oh, and family planning is a good thing. Oh, by the way, people who have these diseases also have primary care needs. And they all want to go to school. And they have other social and economic problems, like bad housing. Now, granted. We didn't always get a sympathetic reading when we went to foundations like that. But usually, we, we, could, we could convince people, and increasingly with time, that these, and this is public health jargon. We used a lot of uh, development and aid effectiveness jargon, so my colleagues will forgive me. Usually, we could convince people interested in AIDS that a vertical intervention, that's the public health term, to treat one problem had to be linked to efforts to strengthen health systems. And if the health systems had collapsed, this is a place in a town called Bukankare. Remember that when it didn't have a bridge, both of you? Um, it was cut off uh, in, during the rainy season, but it, it also had a, an abandoned hospital. And the simple question was, well, can we take some of this money for AIDS and use it to rebuild public health systems? The answer was yes, and none of us has been arrested or gone to jail for it. So. Um, and this is a before and after picture, not of a patient, but of, an, of an, a building, an institution. Now, that's a building is not a system, but it's part of one. As I said, when you start working in a place where there is no hospital um, or clinic or community health worker, you're going to see the need for all three of those levels of care, community-based care, uh, which I haven't talked much about here, but glad to, clinical care and then hospital-level care. And that's what we did across Haiti across central Haiti, um, from the Dominican border, and all in the public sector. So this is, I was asked about, well, what are my five steps towards the future? Uh, and I said, I'm not going to fall for that, even though I made up the name for the talk myself. So I want us to help to figure this out together. It's part of the solution is learning as NGOs and civil society how to strengthen basic public institutions. And those could be public education. In the case of Haiti, in the middle of a cholera epidemic, and I'll go back to that, it's obviously sanitation. And in my line of work, it is public institutions like clinics and hospitals. Now, we were lucky enough to, get, to be invited to Rwanda. Um, and that was one of the best experiences, has been one of the best experiences of my professional life, in part because Haiti, which was so disrupted in those years when, um, obviously, as you can tell, I was in this peculiar situation of actually being friends with the people who became the prime minister or minister of health of the country, which is a bit of a surprise for me. Now I realize some of that's just growing old enough so that your friends become in charge. But their work was seriously hampered by political disruption. And, and I can't count the number of, well, I can count the number of coups that I've lived through, in fact, or the number of ministers of finance or education. So the disruption in Haiti was obviously uh, what had occurred in Rwanda earlier. But in Rwanda, that disruption had slowed down and stopped. And when we were invited in the year 2000, we didn't go until 2004, actually right around the time of another coup in Haiti, um, the government invited us to work with them in order to build a national health system. And we said, well, you know, we're, we're really implementers. We're not. We don't trust ourselves enough on the policy front. 
Um, we see so many policymakers skipping over the social justice piece. That's why I showed you the claims made by people who I actually respect. But the social justice piece, the equity piece, returning to the poor, um, poor women, for example, in the case of Rwanda who are genocide survivors, we knew that that would be our focus. And that the people who invited us to Rwanda said, yes, that's why we're inviting you. I said, well, we're not going to work in the city. We're going to work in a rural area. Yes, that's why we're inviting you. Well, we really don't want to build up an NGO. We want to work to build up a national system. That's why we're inviting you. So that was the reason I say this was one of the best professional experiences of our lives is we got to see in Rwanda what it was like to be a small part of a big effort to take a community-based care that linked uh, to take a model that linked community-based care to clinics and hospitals. Most care occurs, by the way, in clinics or should occur in communities, but also you need hospitals. We got to see what it was like to do that. Um, focusing on our own implementation, this was, as I said, an abandoned hospital. It's the same one that I showed you. That's the before picture of the hospital, and uh, that's uh, about a year later. And the other thing that I'm very proud to say is, in all this, with all this kind of cheap talk of South-South collaboration, it's the Haitians who were experienced implementers who went with us to Rwanda. So all the people we've been working with, the leadership, this is two of my friends, uh, Dr. Maxi Lemonville and Dr. Fernet Leon, who are well known to Michel and Dr. Henri, they went with us and together we worked the Rwandan authorities to scale up this model in three districts, which is not a lot, but knowing that it was also, it was about 10% of the country's population, knowing that it was being uh, echoed and amplified uh, across the country. So the yield, you know, and we said to my Haitian colleagues, said, well, you know, you're going to see patients like the ones we saw back in Haiti, you know, with AIDS or tuberculosis or whatever, wasting consumptive disease, and they'll get better. And there's a lot of skepticism. After all, there has been no doctors in this district, uh, not since the, the genocide and war. This, this place had been abandoned. It had been... Um, and there was a lot of skepticism, but we saw exactly the same kind of patients. This is a, a guy named John, who has, of course, AIDS and tuberculosis. And, uh, and, and as I've said many times, uh, I can't resist saying it, though. Uh, it, maybe it's an American joke, but I think it'll work fine. He goes from looking like Skeletor to looking like he needs Lipitor. <laughs> now, I, I, I told him that, and he thought it was very funny. <laughs> but this is what happens, again, when you have an when you take tools and interventions and apply them equitably. It happens it's the same everywhere. Uh, it didn't matter if it's you know, Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, Haiti, Boston, Navajo Nation. You, know, is you, you have to have the equity strategy. And in this particular instance, instance, that equity strategy was a nationwide strategy. Now, back to... I've got to point this at John Shattuck every time. Now, I said that... Uh, but this was a, not an AIDS project. We, you know, this is not our, that's not what we're interested in is vertical programs and health system strengthening, which is a very dull term, I've got to admit. Trying to make that sexy to funders uh, and supporters is a difficult thing. The national authorities, though, of course, understand it because it's their health system. But what has happened in Rwanda, and uh, some of you may know this, maybe, maybe most of you, I'm, I'm, I'm be curious in discussion, I know, is that these are the steepest declines in mortality ever recorded anywhere at any time. In Europe, United States, anywhere. These declines in mortality, this is ch under five, children under five, same for maternal mortality, death during childbirth, or the death rates due to tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria. And that is a stunning achievement in just 10 years. 19 years ago, back to our myths about aid, 19 years ago, Rwanda was probably the poorest place on the face of the earth. Rwanda was written off as a lost cause, a failed state, uh, and mired endlessly in this cy cycle of poverty and disease. But that's not what has occurred already. And who can tell what's going to happen in the future, but this is already, uh, as I said, a stunning achievement. Now, I'll close with this little uh, warning is every time I said you have a complex health problem, this is a statements that should remind you a lot about statements around AIDS uh, at about the same time. These are about cancer. I could have, you know, taken another example. In fact, I did, uh, was going to use the example 
uh, of drug-resistant tuberculosis because I'd worked with OS, OSI and OSF so much on that problem. But it's, it's a general problem of health equity. And again, when we go back to deconstructing, as we have these last two days, myths about things like cost and effectiveness, and I'll, you know, think about acute leukemia. It, are there other treatments that we've missed for acute leukemia other than chemotherapy? No. Uh, and are these drugs, by and large, on patent or off patent, long off patent? So the idea that it's an insuperable problem to figure out how to cost and then deliver treatment for acute leukemia is not a reasonable assumption. The reasonable assumption is that we haven't addressed these failures of imagination and built a strategy, an equity strategy, that actually allows us to diagnose and care for people with complex and chronic diseases. And I think that's where we are as a species, actually not to be too grand, although Budapest does invite it, um, is that we, we have so many new tools for prevention, for diagnosis, for care. Again, I'm using those terms very generally. But we don't have good equity strategies, not within countries and not across them. Some, of course, have better than other strategies. All of us can think of some. But it, globally, AIDS is, in some ways, I've argued in these last two days, has been the first big global challenge uh, like this. Smallpox, vaccine preventable illness, huge achievement to have eradicated it, but it's not the same as taking on major mental illness, diabetes, uh, or hepatitis C, some of the other. We could go right through the list. So just to close with, I can't not comment on the earthquake, of course. And I, I've already gone through this integration of prevention and care. A great example, for example, uh, would, would be cervical cancer, right? Because now we have a vaccine, uh, we have good diagnostics, or you can diagnose cervical cancer quite easily and early, and you can actually cure it in many patients right there when you diagnose it. And, uh, and I would encourage anybody who doesn't know about this, who may be at risk for cervical cancer, to understand that that diagnosis and treatment to cure can happen at the same, same time. And you can always take good care of someone who's sick and isn't curable, right? AIDS isn't curable. Diabetes isn't usually curable. Um, and the same holds for cervical cancer. And, um, is you have good prevention, you have good diagnosis, you have good care, and you even have good palliative care for people who can't be cured. That's what we should be doing uh, where, whenever we can. These are pictures from Haiti, and, and uh, they're all from Haiti, actually. We uh, also work in, in Rwanda and Malawi. Now, just a closing comment, then I'll open it up for discussion. Um, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm with my Haitian friends here. This is where we were on the eve of the, of the earthquake. Uh, we had taken this model in Haiti from the Dominican border at Belladere, again, all public sector facilities, to the coast of San Marc. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying it was great. I'm just saying that it was satisfying work and we were making a lot of progress. Uh, and again, all in public sector facilities. And it's hard, I mean, I, I, there are people who are specialists in predicting bad things and risk reduction, and, but we've been living and working there, and as I said, through a lot of difficult times, and I don't think, and no one I knew, and I, you know, Michelle or Danielle can say, no one I knew was saying that something like this was either likely to happen or possible, but then, then it did. And, uh, and I'm just going to mention um, that if you're a health provider, uh, and outside of, you know, inside of Port-au-Prince or outside, this was calamitous for all kinds of reasons. The obvious ones, that is, so much, uh, so many lives lost and so many friends of ours who died that day and, and employees and family. But also, the, the blow to the medical profession, those in training, was also very significant. Um, this is the National Nursing School. Very few people in the second uh, year class or their professors survived. And this has been the focus of a lot of our work since years. I had been planning to focus, again, this is a personal addendum, on Rwanda. I was in Haiti on vacation with my family. Uh, and we had actually been to the general hospital, I remember, just before, uh, just before Christmas in, uh, uh, in late December. And then th this occurred, the earthquake occurred, destroying much of the medical infrastructure, in, in, at least in Port-au-Prince. Now, one of the problems, to be overly clinical about it, is that the, the, the medical infrastructure was heavily concentrated in Port-au-Prince. All the teaching hospitals, such as they were, were there, with very minor exception. 
that's probably not true anywhere you know, in Hungary or, uh, or the United States or anywhere that you've been where everything's invested in one city. Now, some places, but most of the time, you have many cities, cities where there are infrastructures. This was all in port prince So rebuilding that part of the, the formula, which is teaching hospitals and medical schools, we talked a lot about that in Budapest. This is why I underline what I called tertiary education and tertiary care. That's one of the myths, and some people looked at it and said, well, why would you elevate tertiary education and tertiary care? And the answer is because there's a lot of talented people in Haiti who want to go to university or be doctors or physicists or nurses, but if there's no investment in anything than, other than private uh, education, they, they won't be able to except by leaving Haiti. So we had already learned these lessons the hard way, and we're committed to both tertiary education and tertiary care. I mean, care of cancer is, of course, tertiary care. Lots of care, uh, trauma care, et cetera. The example I gave you was the Boston Marathon. And on, uh, and on a, this is what happened, and I use these data here, and I, they seem kind of grim, and they are, is if you look at what the generous outpouring after the earthquake, which we did, just to give an example from my country, more than half of all American households donated to earthquake relief. This isn't about that generosity. This is about humanitarian aid, official assistance, which is not about relief, uh, rebuilding, but it's about humanitarian aid. And it is true that the Haitian state, because it was based so heavily in Port-au-Prince, uh, was uh, crippled. That's true. In fact, some people estimate that up to 20% of all employees of the Haitian Ministry of Health uh, were badly injured or died on that one day or the day after. But that doesn't mean that we should keep skirting the public sector, as Michelle had told us again and again when she was prime minister, coming from, an, like me, an NGO, civil society background. We still have to find ways to build up public health and public education and public sanitation. Now that leads us back to the five myths. So instead of doing what I did during the Budapest conference, which is reading my paper, I feel, I feel like I have addressed all five of these in the course of this presentation. It's not true that foreign aid doesn't work. It's true that foreign aid, as construed, doesn't work. But you can have an enormous impact if you invest in health systems. Uh, and those are often transnational investments. For example, the United States to Haiti, or you know, fill in, Norway to fill in the blank. So don't believe it that it doesn't work. The question is how can it be reconceived, and I've called for uh, something called accompaniment, which is not a very original idea, that we need long-term engagement uh, with partners in an egalitarian way over many years. It's what I've tried to do, and lots of other people have, have as well. And that's not just people out from outside of Haiti, people from inside of Haiti who have devoted their whole lives to healthcare and education uh, for their poorer compatriots. It is not true that we can't provide high quality secondary and tertiary medical care in places like Rwanda or Haiti. The Rwandans wouldn't tolerate that claim in any case. It's also not true we can't provide high quality tertiary education in those places. And indeed, that's desperately needed. Universities, graduate schools like you have here, uh, CEU, for example, we could use one of these uh, in, in Haiti. Someone, one of our colleagues one of, uh, from Burma kept on talking about Johns Hopkins. Where did he go? <laughs> he fled because I said, well, there are other universities than Johns Hopkins. We need tertiary education uh, in, in places like Haiti. Governments, it's true they are weak, and they are certainly corrupt governments. I, I, I regard some of the things that the United States government has done in foreign policy and domestic as fundamentally corrupt. I wouldn't back them. It is also true that sometimes we conflate, here I know you wanted me to say this, Abby, that we conflate poor and weak systems with corrupt systems. It happens all the time. You know, if we, if we are in Burundi or Rwanda and don't have a tax collection system or expert, experts who know how to do this, uh, not only will they become corrupt, but again, it is possible to mistake uh, a very weak public system for a corruption. And that happened a lot to my own friends who had the courage to go into the public sector and, yes, fight real corruption, but really also fight for basic systems and civil services. Police, 
school, teachers, housing. That's what we need to invest in as well. Four, for me to say NGOs are the solution is like saying I am the solution. I come from an NGO background. Many of the people in this room do. Not intending to leave it. Civil society is where I feel like I belong and can make my contribution, but that doesn't mean we are the solution. We can't make headway in public health and public education and public sanitation without learning how to partner, yes, of course, with other people in the private sector, but also with public authorities charged with promoting public health, public education, and public sanitation. And then some other, we can just talk about these. The idea that anyone has all the solutions to their own problems is absurd. You know, on the day of the Boston Marathon, I'm, in, I'm thinking about that a lot because I'm from there. If you, you wouldn't expect someone who'd been injured to be the architect of his or own, her own repair as a surgeon. The idea that we can ask people living in, in great poverty to figure out how to power their homes and villages uh, is absurd, and it happens all the time. We celebrate local homegrown solutions when, again, we're really conflating deep poverty uh, with some romanticized notion of participation. We've got to be careful not to do that. Uh, we're not poor. No, and I'm not poor. And I doubt anybody who's in this room in Budapest uh, could be classified or would be classified by the patients who I see in clinic as poor. And we, we've got to be careful not to make the mistake uh, that I think happens too often of thinking anyone has a solution to all these problems. And I made a tribute uh, earlier to, uh, today to some of the technical experts we've invited to join us here in Budapest who do know about tax systems, who do know about how to manage complex public-private enterprises, who do understand uh, how to build up capacity, uh, including capacity for transparency and accountability as a technical investment, which is an important investment. It requires money, resources, things like electricity, computers, accountants, experts. That has to be built as well. So let me stop here uh, with this last image. We did build that hospital um, in central Haiti, not in downtown Port-au-Prince. It is a teaching hospital, tertiary care facility. In fact, just to make you smile a little bit, because I smile whenever I see this, um, and this is all since the earthquake, and we're told, well, nothing can get done in Haiti. Well, let me tell you, building a 300-bed medical center, try doing that in Budapest or Boston in just two years. So that's not true either, that you can't get things done. And my favorite part, back to tertiary, is people would say, oh, it's called the University Hospital of Mirabale, and but there's no university. And we always say, not yet. Thank you. <laughs> I know I went over a little bit, John. You want to just take questions directly from there, or would you like to? I like it when you're up here near me. All right. Okay. Even if I do all the. All right. Let's see if we can pick some good ones out. I know there are many. And I'm sorry to go over. So let, let me you open. Put on your mic. Oh, I'll just turn it on. The little do that. part at the end goes up here. Um, let's see if we get this, this machine properly on. I guess that would start like that. On. There. So yours is also on, I think. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, so let me, let me start, Paul, if I may, and, and then I want to very quickly go out to the audience because we don't have a lot of time. But I, I am fascinated by your observation about transparency and, and the efforts to battle corruption, which often are coming from the top down in first world countries. We have a lot of institutions that are, and in fact laws that are trying to uh, assure that uh, there's no corruption in the distribution of aid, et cetera. Um, and yet I think several of your slides demonstrate very dramatically that this curtails uh, some of the effective delivery mechanisms. But you also said that it's important for local institutions and, and the, the local population to engage in trying to make sure that effective use is being made of funds that are coming in. Could you just say a little bit more about that? 
I, I can, and, and I, uh, again, there are other people in this room who are uh, experts <clears throat> more than I am, but I would just say that when we first got, this is maybe 15 years ago, a little, we, it was after, you know, I'd been there a long time and been working as a physician there, and we first got a, uh, a grant from what would be the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, a journalist came up to the clinic, and I was seeing a patient, and she walked right in. That, of course, that would mean that she's American. <laughs> and uh, I said, hi, who are you? And uh, she said, oh, I'm, I'm, and then she named a radio station. And I said, well, you know, I'm actually seeing a patient right now. Can, can I, <laughs> could you wait a second? And um, so if, I went and t talked to her. She interviewed me. This is, uh, and the first thing she said was, you know, I thought we were kind of celebrating that, we, that Haiti was going to get this Global Fund grant, as you'll recall. And she said, well, what about, you know, what about corruption? And this is before we even got the grant, before Haiti got the grant. I, look, I looked around. And I said, well, I, mean, I was hoping to save her just a minute of <laughs> happiness about this. But I said to her, and I, uh, you know, look around you. You're in a squatter settlement. You know, you have to have things like, again, electricity, uh, what I called an infrastructure of accountability. And I didn't really know much about it. And Kieran, I don't know if you like that term. But I, I was saying, you know, we're in a squatter settlement in rural Haiti. We have to train people locally to do that, and we will do that by implementing this project. And, and we did. In fact, we trained people in all those towns and villages who were all Haitian to learn how to you know, build that infrastructure of accountability. Now, that's a, in, in, in terms of the money we're talking about with uh, what we're calling here foreign assistance, that's chump change, right? $2.1 million, something. Right. a lot of money for an NGO. But or for a, a government with empty coffers in the public sector. Mm. But we're talking about billions of dollars being invested in Haiti that we, we don't see the results. In part, not I'm not saying only, but one of the things that worries me, John, is that part of it is due to this elevation of process without a focus on outcomes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we wouldn't do that in medicine. You know, we'd say, well, you know, it's a, the famous joke, the operation went really well, but the, the patient died. Right, right. And that's how a lot of foreign aid is. It's not only short ter term ADD, but the focus on process sometimes comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm concerned with that cost, uh, with that focus, because I would, I think there's enough money when you look at the, uh, the flows. And we did, uh, my colleagues, Abby and Jahan, who are here with me, we, we built up this little office, as you know, and try to look at all the pledges of, after this cake. Okay, First, to figure out how many of them actually got to Haiti, which is a, a, a small fraction, alas. But then how many of them got into a public sector or public-private partnership? And I gave you the numbers. It was a tiny, mm. tiny mm. fraction. 0.9% mm. went uh, through the government. Now, why would we want it to go through the government? Not because we're not an NGO, but because we want to see Haitian institutions strengthened. And part of that strengthening comes by investing in those institutions. and. Uh, you know, again, there's all kinds of aid jargon, building up local capacity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We struggled with that in a good way. I think Marine will agree with me. We struggled with that very fruitfully uh, during the course of the last two days mm -hmm. here. Well, let me open up for questions, please. And if you could identify yourself and, uh, and limit your, your question to some short time, if you could. Thank you. And my question, um, well, first of all, thank you for this uh, great, great uh, lecture. And uh, a lot of what you're saying is really music to my ears because I see that there is a lot of uh, funding going to Haiti. I heard that it is uh, very often addressed as the Republic of NGOs. And I know that there were, according to UN statistics, 3,000 NGOs in the country before uh, the earthquake in 2010. And now they, there are estimates that there are more than 10,000 NGOs, actually. So what I was really interested in is, uh, do you see that there is uh, a change in coordination or a strategic or, a, or an operational level? Because I see that due to the scarcity of funds, uh, probably a stronger communication in um, aligning uh, NGO activities with uh, governmental strategic objectives could help a lot in yeah. bringing better results even though the money might be the same. Yeah. So, well, you. I mean, I don't see backward movement. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you know, that sounds like damning with faint praise, <laughs> right? That, but that's good news. It's not, it's not backward movement. For example, that term, the Republic of NGOs, a lot of people know that. I mean, I, again, I've used it very often, and I keep saying, but, and I'm a member of that, I mean, I'm a citizen of that republic. So it's not meant to disparage NGOs. Well, maybe. And uh, a lot of people know that, and certainly in Haiti, the public authorities all know it, and, and also still all work with NGOs, by the way. Um, the, the question is, is coordination getting better? I think it is. Now, there have been some uh, disappointments. Uh, um, for example, you have a, you know, a cholera epidemic, and suddenly there's an inrush of attention, and then you know, six months later, everybody's gone. Everybody, I mean the NGOs that came in to do that, or same with disaster relief. But I'm arguing that that's not the right approach. The right approach is long-term accompaniment, where you measure engagement, uh, I think, probably in decades, not in a year or so. I, that's why I started by saying, the first year I spent in Haiti, I don't know that I did anything good for anybody Haitian. Did a lot good for me, got into Harvard Medical School. <laughs> it, took, it, it takes a long time. And I think that awareness is growing in Haiti. Among the NGO community, it certainly is well it's apparent to the, the authorities. I will also add um, that there was an office to coordinate NGOs established by the Haitian authorities in the Ministry of Planning. It had all of two people in the office, and both were killed in the earthquake. Mm. And you know, these are people that we knew and worked with. Mm. Um, and so the pace at which improvement is occurring is slow. Uh, it's slower than we would have wished. It's slower compared to Rwanda, where that's been much more forcefully imposed. But I don't think um, that there is less awareness of this problem now than there was before the earthquake. There's a lot of mess, uh, in part because of uh, the earthquake, and, and the pro frank frankly, the proximity to the United States and other places where there's a lot of desire to help, but not a lot of desire to coordinate. Yeah. I'm Christoph Forger, the director of the OSFCU liaison office now. But a few years ago, I worked in Southeast Asia and South America on resource scarce issues in oil producing districts. And I'm wondering if in a post-earthquake uh, situation, when money suddenly flows in for a while, and then the issue sort of dies off the international press and the uh, influx of money um, is smaller, do, do you see parallels? With the uh, with the resource scarce situation, and if yes, how are you addressing that? Yeah. How am I addressing it? <laughs> no, I'm mean, not you, but I'm. Mean, I'm going to. I'm gonna thinking about it. I'm going to discover oil, and then I'm going to manage all the. Yeah, I'm going to manage all the resources. Um, I think there are disturbing parallels, right? Um, I, I would say, however, that uh, you know, in, you're seeing a spike. Uh, after an event like, you know, the same thing happened in the United States after Hurricane Katrina, right? Suddenly, everyone understands how race and class work in the United States. But it's been a problem for a lot longer than, you know, in 2005, right? So the revelatory capacity of an event like that, an earthquake or, you know, the, uh, you know Hurricane Katrina, is, uh, is powerful in Haiti. And again, a lot of people got interested. Some of them stayed interested. And uh, some, in, you know, some institutions who weren't involved in Haiti are still involved in Haiti. A lot of them, in, including the more professional, professionalized NGOs, and uh, meaning international NGOs, came in and out. Uh, now, what am I doing to stop that? Well, you know, I'm writing things about it and giving a talk here in Budapest and wrote a whole book about what you were talking about, by the way, which my mother read, I know. <laughs> um, how effective that is, I'm not sure, uh, but we're, we're also trying to bolster um, the Haitian public sector, the, the government, and, uh, and trying to build coalitions of uh, NGOs to focus on this accompaniment model, to focus on coordination. Um, and again, in, in Rwanda, where I've described a great pleasure in working, it's actually much more imposed. Um, and you know, we've also brought colleagues from Rwanda and Haiti together to talk about this problem. In fact, here in Budapest, uh, we did that as well. And um, 
those are some of the things I'm doing and we're doing. Partners in Health, uh, as I said, the NGO that I've been lucky enough to work with, only works with the public sector uh, now. Mm. That took 10 years for me to figure out. I'm glad that mm. other people in this room didn't take 10 years. Now, uh, you know, I could excuse my youth, right, at the time. But we now only try to work in the public sector, meaning that hospital that we just built, which was built entirely with private donations, uh, is a public sector facility owned lock, stock, and barrel by the Ministry of Health. And the idea there is if we take an accompaniment model and apply it to a teaching hospital, we obviously intend to train the next generation of Haitian doctors and nurses or help train them uh, with institutions like that. So those are some of the things we're doing. Mm. And we, we were hoping, I guess you could say, to use suasion uh, to get more people on board, but we don't think that, uh, that funders, people who control resources, should not know about these problems, and they shouldn't fund uh, uncritically uh, endeavors that are not engaged in you know, long-term accompaniment, public sector uh, rebuilding, creation of local capacity and local jobs, and uh, you know, some of the things that I try to lay out in the course of my, uh, now I'm not a funder, you were a fun. You are a funder, <laughs> and I and I, I. That's why I'm here. I'm also saying to my friends in that world and colleagues, this is how we think you should proceed as well. And we've hosted a number of uh, gatherings with foundations, and uh, you know, and obviously we've we've talked with governments as much as they'll listen as well about why this accompaniment approach should be the next iteration of what in the past we've called foreign aid. Is that is it? How did I do? <laughs> Take the microphone, please. And you used the word investment a lot. And, and again, going back to the resource scarce issue, yes, you build facilities and you create capacities. And, and then what happens when you have to operate them and upkeep? And, you know, I don't want to use the word sustainability because please it's don't. a bit, bit different than that. But what, is there capacity to keep on going? Well, I mean, first of all, completely fair question. I'm not. I'm. I'm glad you asked that question. It is a burdensome question. It's. 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 Um, it's kind of unfair of you to ask me, <laughs> but it's important. And I'll just tell you two examples. Um, you know what I mean by unfair is every time you try to do something that's difficult like this in a place like Haiti, the first thing you ask is how is this sustainable? And now I used to in the old days say, well, you know what, life isn't sustainable. <laughs> and uh, I, don't do, I don't say sarcastic things like that anymore. <laughs> and I never said that to any of my patients. <laughs> you know, I, I never said that to any patient. But in Rwanda, we built a hospital not as, not, not as large as that one. This is the largest solar, that's the largest solar-powered hospital in the developing world today. Wow. And uh, by the way, solar, sustainable. Can I get some yes, credit, you please? Yes, got it. We, we brought it up. Um, but the one we built in Rwanda, which is only three years ago, which started the first uh, mm -hmm. cancer treatment center in rural Africa, probably anywhere. I mean, you guys can look it up and see if I'm right or not. I mean, we didn't build it so we could say, we built the first rural AIDS, uh, you know, cancer treatment program. But I think it is. That's what everybody said about that, too, and about, about cancer care. How is this sustainable? And by then, I had learned to bite my tongue and not say, <laughs> you know, you're not sustainable. Um, <laughs> But the Rwandan government has stepped in, and now, only three years after completing that hospital, they're paying 52% of all the salaries. And that's great. Another, another way that things become sustainable is that you use you know, economies of scale. I'm sure you know more about this than I do. And, you, and all kinds of ideas like pooled procurement, and you actually drop operating costs significantly. Now, I'm not saying, though, that I'm not frightened of this. Um, Someone, one of my colleagues said, this hospital is the biggest risk that Partners in Health has ever taken. <laughs> and I, we, you know, I said, that's true, but that's a scandalous, right? We're a health organization. We're in the middle of a health crisis. We've been working in 80, 30 years. There's no teaching hospital. They just all got destroyed. And we're saying it's a risk for us <clears throat> to build the hospital. That notion of risk, which is flipped over, I'm sure you, you've, you've all seen this, is completely inverted, right? It's, it shouldn't be a risk 
my risk that I'm worried about or the risk to partners and others. So the risk to poor people and you know people who are injured, like in the, I keep, that's why I keep going back to the Boston Marathon example. That's the risk we need to worry about, people dying unattended. And I'm not lecturing to you, I'm just saying we have to grab that language back and, and reclaim it, as you said, you know, the S word. We have, to, we have to learn more, not just about financing it long term and dropping the prices and making sure there's local capacity building and all this stuff that we agreed upon here in Budapest, but also I think reclaiming the language of sustaining something. Because if you look at the capital flows, and I'm not an economist, although I try to play one on TV. <laughs> if you look at the capital flows, it would be a nothing to sustain this just based on money going into Haiti in foreign aid. You could sustain a hospital like this, which is the largest hospital, for probably under $10 million a year, which is, again, the, the operating budget of the hospital that I work in in Boston is probably $3 billion a year. And there are three of them, well, not, nothing's quite like my, that <laughs> hospital, but there are, there are other teaching hospitals. Well, great, I think, great I think question. <clears throat> if we could end on this, uh, I will make, uh, ask you one very short question, and I think it will lead to a very upbeat answer, because you've given us, as Paul so often does, uh, so many reasons to um, understand how what seems impossible can be overcome, and, and what, uh, what may not appear in some traditional terms to be sustainable, in fact, uh, is. So my question is, you gave us a lot of evidence, and you just stated it now, um, about the, the very low cost of bringing in some of these very basic elements, including a hospital. Much lower cost in the places that you serve, that is, the, where, yeah. where poverty really is, is there, much lower cost than in any of the first world settings. So what turns, is it true that what you call the equity gap actually is not that difficult to fill, at least in the short term, and in the long term, maybe indeed development will take off. Well, you know, I would put, I would, and this is just a hypothesis, John, yeah. but I would push it even, even further. I would say, I mean, I can tell you that this hospital, uh, I can tell you what it costs per square foot, which isn't even a tenth of what it would cost in Budapest right. or a 20th of what it would cost in New York. Right. I, mean, I don't know. I didn't price out Budapest so, uh, right. Hungarian cement yet, <laughs> but I'm guessing. <clears throat> and what I would say is not only is it doable if we rethink uh, uh, aid and move toward this accompaniment model, but I would say it costs more not to do it. If we have any notion yeah. of a sustainable, and, and by the way, I, I think it's important, like I said, that we reclaim that word. But the idea of having a, a sustainable planet that's peaceful and you know kindly without taking on the equity gap, I, it's just hard for me to envision. It's just, this is what poor people call structural violence, right? When they're subjected because of you know, racism or gender inequality or just brute poverty to everyday risks like the people I see, that they might not use the term structural violence, but they'll, you know, I've often heard the, the idea that that's a violence done unto them. And I think that's cost a lot, you know, and I, I don't, I think it'd be a lot less to, you know, do what's the right thing anyway and try to provide some of these uh, basic amenities and services uh, where they're needed most. And I think if we look at poverty reduction, uh, you know, we have reason, as you said, to take heart. You know, mm -hmm. poverty can be tackled. Extreme poverty could be, and will be, I hope, wiped out. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, let me ask everyone to join me in thanking Paul for an extraordinary lecture. Thank you. Thank you.